Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining in the message today. Our prayer is that it would strengthen you and encourage you in your faith. And if it does that, please consider sharing this content so we can continue to spread the good news into our communities, to our friends, and our families, and all around the world for Jesus. And if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, then please introduce yourself via our website, which is victorymj.com, or send us an email at connect at victorymj.com. We can also have the conversation on social media. Just look for Victory Church MJ, and you'll find us on all the social platforms. Thanks again for joining us. Blessings. Now let's head into the message. Seated. So how many of you have ever heard of Ripley's Believe It or Not? Anybody heard of that? Ripley's Believe It or Not. It began actually, I looked it up this week, it began as a newspaper, believe it or not. It began as a newspaper uh, in the 1920s, uh, just a little before that. And of course, it's grown into a massive franchise. It has radio and TV shows and a whole bunch of museums. In in fact, believe it or not, (laughs) I might say that a few times, I apologize ahead of time. Uh, They get more than 12 million guests a year at their attractions. And uh, you say, wow, what has made this company, this franchise, so successful for more than 100 years? Well, uh, Ripley's, believe it or not, specializes in unusual things, unusual events and items that are surprising to viewers. And, of course, human beings love intrigue. We love things that just kind of go, really? Are you kidding me? What? Uh, Actually, I I, I was trying to find... Uh, fun facts about Ripley's Believe It or Not this week, because I thought it'd be interesting to say Believe It or Not about them. And I found out that Believe it or, Ripley's Believe It or Not is actually part of the Jimmy Patterson Group. Jimmy Patterson Group owns that. And believe it or not, Jimmy Patterson is a Canadian, one of the richest men in Canada, for a time was the richest man in Canada. He's, believe it or not, he's also an outspoken, spirit-filled, Jesus-loving Christian. And uh, believe it or not, he also has Saskatchewan roots and gives to many ministries and churches both in Saskatchewan, Canada, and around the world. Kind of cool. Anyway, all just interesting things. Isn't that interesting? You, You hear things like that, you're like, oh, oh, oh. So Jesus, when he taught, he could have easily titled many of his teachings, believe it or not. Because his teachings were so surprising, so counterintuitive, so completely opposite than this world's way of thinking that we actually take the teachings of Christ and many times we call them the upside down teachings or the upside down kingdom. Jesus called his his, uh, way of living, his way of viewing life, he called it the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God was this whole vision that Jesus was casting for life the way God meant it to be. A life that was good and beautiful and full and rich and meaningful and uh, uh, fully uh, uh, alive and free of the the mess and brokenness um, that sin has caused. And Jesus cast this beautiful vision for life, but then he said the way to this life and the way of this life is different than you would think. It's different. And again, over and over again, um, he would say, actually, the way up, in the kingdom of God is down. The, the first are going to be last and the last are going to be first. And those who give their lives away are actually going to find life. And, and those who give will, will receive. And just every, every time you make an, ex, an assumption about the way life and the world works, just check it with Jesus, right? Because he may come along and say, believe it or not, believe it or not, it actually goes the other way. And of course, the beautiful thing is, is when you grab hold of the kingdom of God, the truth sets you free. Now, it almost always makes you uncomfortable while it does that, (laughs) right? It almost always messes with you. You're like, whoa. But it does set us free. And it is the path to joy and fruitfulness and meaning and life and hope and freedom and so forth. And some of those secrets of the kingdom of God are found in a a group of Jesus' teachings we call the parables. 42 times in the Gospels, uh, there are recorded parables that Jesus told. Of course, he likely told many more than that. And uh, we've been looking at some of these parables over the last while as a church, actually through the summer. And uh, last week, we looked at two parables, two short parables about seeds. And we're actually going to continue last week's sermon today. So this is what we learned last week. We learned that in God's kingdom, it's often the small and seemingly inconsequential things. This is what's counterintuitive. Believe it or not, in God's kingdom, It's often the small and seemingly inconsequential things that end up having the biggest and most significant impact. 
So in our lives, in the world, what makes the biggest and most significant impact? Surprisingly, sometimes those small and what you think, what I think is going to be inconsequential, and yet God has a different plan. And so just because something starts small, it doesn't mean it's not going to be significant. And just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean God's not working. And just because it's going slow, <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not happening and that it's not going to happen. So this is what Jesus taught. Matthew chapter 4, we'll start in verse 26. Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, and he doesn't understand how it happens. And the earth produces crops on its own. The first, a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of the wheat are formed, and then finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. That's the end of that story. It's the only place that that story is recorded. And then Jesus tells the second story, back to back, two seed stories here. Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? I'm trying to help you grasp something that's going to be so counterintuitive to you that I'm going to tell you a story about it, and it's going to cause you to tilt. And as you meditate on it, I'm going to sow this truth into your heart that, of course, will multiply there, okay? How can I describe the kingdom of God? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground, the smallest of all seeds, just a tiny little seed, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows strong branches, and birds can make nests in its shade. So what are the secrets of the seed? The first two we talked about last week, I'll just go over them really quickly. Uh, and you can, as Pastor Barry said, you can go back and listen to that message. Um, but the first one is that it's small, right? It starts just as a tiny seed. It's super easy to miss. And to our surprise, God delights in starting with the small, the weak, the broken. I love how in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, he says to the Corinthian church, he says, look, guys, when God called you, you weren't that special. He says, not many of you were very smart, just saying, right? Not many of you were very strong, right? And, and the truth is, when you, when you read that 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you read Paul talking to the Corinthian church, we all look at ourselves and go, I'm exhibit A, right? Why would God choose me? Why would God use me? Are you kidding me? And person after person in the Bible, right, says, no, God, you've got the wrong guy. You've got the wrong girl. I, I can't speak. I'm too young. I'm too old. I don't have the right gifts, Somebody else is more special than me, and yet God delights. Like Zechariah 4.10 says, don't despise the small beginnings because God specializes in them. And of course, you never want to underestimate the power of just a little seed, right? Just a mustard seed. Uh, Jesus, of course, one time used the, the reference to the mustard seed of faith. He says, if you have faith just like a little mustard seed, you can move a mountain. I heard somebody say uh, a while back, they said, I've got a mustard seed of faith and I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> right? So we have to make sure we don't allow the enemy to tell us you're no big deal, you're too young, you're too old, you're not gifted enough, you're not smart enough, you're not holy enough. Why? Because God uses the small, the weak, the insignificant. And so you gotta be a mustard seed and say, God, I'm gonna be small and I'm gonna let you do something big through me. And whether it's a prayer or a good deed or an encouraging word or a gift, every, every act of obedience to Jesus that you do is a seed that you sow. And, and again, it might seem small, but I'll tell you, God does big things. All right. Second thing is it's hidden power. God supernaturally uh, works in hidden ways, Right? And this is so interesting. Uh, uh, so many times we can't see the work of God, but God tells us he's faithfully working by his spirit. And we look and we're like, I don't feel it. I don't see it. And yet uh, it's amazing uh, when you look back and you go, oh yeah, yeah, God, you were right. You indeed were working. Um, so there's a partnership that we have with God. We sow, but God does the supernatural piece. Or, or the way I like to say it is, we do our natural and God adds his supernatural to our natural and does, does what only God can do. And of course, God does some of his best work in hiddenness, um, quietly, powerfully, 
growing his kingdom, growing his work in our lives and in other people's lives, which leads me to the third one. And here we go. This is for today. You ready? Okay, three people are ready. I'm glad. Here it is. I know you're going to be excited. It's slow and steady. (laughs) That's the way the kingdom works. It's a gradual deal. And of course, we learn this again and again in Scripture, that God is not on your timetable. Right? How many of you have discovered that before? Right? Man, it's like, God, I'm praying for you to do this. Right? It's like, how about now, Lord? Right? It's sometime soon. It's like the guy, see if I can get this story right. I, uh, this guy who says, uh, God, you know, the Bible says a thousand years is like a day to you. So what's, what's like a, a million years to you? And God says, what's well, irrelevant? It's like a, a second. And so this guy just was thinking about that. He's pretty blown away. And he says, well, God, then what's like a million dollars to you? And God says, well, it's, again, it makes no difference to me. That's like a penny. And the guy looks at God and he says, well, God, could I have just a penny? And God smiles, looks back and says, sure, just wait a second. (laughs) All right, right? (laughs) You know, in scripture, we actually see God move in what are called the suddenlies of the Bible. You see these spots where God says, suddenly God did this and this. But if you look at the suddenlies, you'll see that there's a process that leads up to them. In Acts chapter two, suddenly the Holy Spirit comes upon his church and the church you know, grows and reaches people and so on. But you look before that and there's days and days of seeking God and prayer where there's no suddenly at all. There's hidden gradualness taking place, right? Um, And of course, you see that in our our text that first a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat, then finally the grain ripens. And there's this sense even in our own lives when God's working that we're like, I'm just not seeing what I wish I saw. I'm not changing like I should be changing. Uh, uh, you, ever, you ever just felt sort of frustrated with yourself for the lack of progress you feel like you're making? Okay, maybe it's just me. Or you ever felt frustrated with the person next to you for the lack of progress they seem to be making, <laughs> right? Right, I mean, we all get times where we're like, God, if you would just hurry up on your timetable. And yet God is in the process of maturing us. And, and that just takes moment by moment, day by day. Um, I love Galatians 6, 9. says, let's not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There's this call to simple faithfulness day by day, not getting discouraged by the slow process, and knowing that the kingdom of God is often an imperceptible day by day, moment by moment. Just like when you watch a plant, and you're like, come on, plant, grow! Right? If you just stare at that plant, you're probably not going to you know, get too motivated. But if you trust the process, if you say, I'm going to be patient, I'm going to trust the process, you look back after a few weeks and you go, oh my goodness. John Maxwell says it this way in his book, Today Matters. Real sustainable change doesn't happen in a moment. It's a process. The way you live your life today is sowing seeds. It's preparing for your tomorrow. So make today a masterpiece. Start now, start small. Start now, start small. You just say, okay, it's, it's day by day, it's little by little, it's doing the right thing today, and then another day, and then another day. It's the power of seeing that transformation happens daily, not in a day. Did you catch that? Transformation happens daily, not in a day. In fact, John Maxwell, who's written, what, over 60, 80 books, something like that, his favorite book that he's ever written is this book, Today Matters, where he just talks about the power of just saying, this day, plant the right seeds. Do the right things. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, talks about the transformation in our lives. It says, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Isn't that an interesting phrase? And this comes from where? From the Lord who is the Spirit. In other words, as you gaze at Jesus, as you continue your life and your walk, the Holy Spirit is at work in your soul. And again, sometimes you don't feel like it, Sometimes you're not even aware of it, but God's at work, how? Degree by degree, by degree, by degree, by degree. Have you ever watched water boil, right? How does that happen? Degree by degree by degree, the water's just just coming along, heating up, heating up. 
bit by bit, little by little, and there is a suddenly, right? There's that boiling point. And transformation takes place. But when you're not seeing the boiling point, when you're not seeing the, the fruit, when, you're not, when it's not harvest time, then remind yourself, God's still at work. The kingdom's still moving forward. The progress might look smaller and slower than I would like, but God's not on my timetable. And of course, the crazy thing is that, again, in the short term, it, it goes slower than you think. But in the long term, when you look back, you go, oh my goodness, that has added up a lot more than I ever realized it possibly could. Um, and of course, sometimes we call that uh, the power of, of compound growth or multiplying growth, which is where I want to go because this is the last point. God's kingdom is like a seed sown. It starts small. You can, you can miss it. It's hidden. You hardly believe something's happening. It's slow and steady. So you have to be patient. It's going to add up. And then the last thing is that it multiplies. It multiplies. And of course, the kingdom of God is not just for you. God pours his kingdom into your life, but God's goal is that that blessing would come into your and my life and then extend from our lives. Abraham, God says, way back in Genesis, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing, right? You and, and your seed. In your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. In John 7, Jesus said, I'm the living water, and if you drink from me, you'll never thirst again. But then he says something interesting. He says, you will never thirst again. But then he says, and out of you, not, not the guy next to you, not your pastor, not the worship leader, not, not, not somebody else, out of you will flow rivers of living water. And the Bible says that, that's, yeah, you can clap for that. Good job. There it is. Woo! Right? <laughs> Out of you will flow rivers of living water. Ah, that, 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 that. You're not only going to get satisfied, you're not only going to be filled with the goodness of God, but you're going to spread the life of God, the goodness of God, the satisfaction of God to other people. And of course, who would think that a little mustard seed would grow into all of this uh, uh, real estate where the birds can gather in the branches? There's multiplying power in every single seed. Multiplying power. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the apostle Paul is receiving a, an offering. And he's asking the Corinthian church to give financially. And he tells them, hey, you, you, you uh, sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But if you sow abundantly, you're going to reap abundantly. He gives them all these reasons and motivations for giving, talks all about giving. And he says this in verse 10 of chapter 9. He says, first, God supplies every need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. In other words, your life becomes about more than you. Your life becomes this generous, overflowing, giving, serving, loving, blessing life as God blesses you. And, and, and of course, that's true about finances, but it's true about every single area of your life. And you don't wait until you have a whole bunch before you start sowing. How many of you know that? You'll never get seed to sow that way. You start with whatever you have. And you simply say, I know the kingdom works. I sow, I reap, multiple back. Then I sow more, then I reap multiple back. And this multiplying power is quite fascinating. I'm, I, I, uh, I'll finish up pretty quick here, but let me just give you a quick illustration of this because it's one of my fun illustrations. Uh, a piece of paper is pretty thin, right? Uh, it's pretty, you know, I don't know how thin that is, but I think it's less than a millimeter. So if you fold it in half, how thick is it? Twice as thick, <laughs> twice as, thick as it was before. I don't know, it's twice, okay. If you fold it in half again, of course, it's four times a piece of paper, right? Not just two. So it's two folds, but now it's four because we're working with multiples, right, instead of just addition. If you fold it in half a third time, what is that? Eight sheets of paper, right? A fourth time is going to be 16 sheets of paper. A fifth time is going to be 32 sheets of paper. Where am I? <laughs> a sixth time. A sixth time is a whole bunch more. And then, depending on the piece of paper, if you have Bible paper, it actually folds a little easier, but I didn't want to use one of my Bible papers. 
A seventh time, and it's, you know, maybe, what, a half an inch thick or something like that, a whole bunch of pieces of paper thick. Okay, that's seven times folding. So what happens when you get to 25 times? Because that's seven times. How thick do you think it is at 25 times? Now we're at half an inch. Okay, so what's going to happen? It's going to go to an inch, two inches, four inches, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128 inches, 256 inches, right? 512 inches, 1,000 inches. Each time we fold, and we've only done a few folds there. We're at 1,000 inches and 2,000, 4,000, 6, right, right, 8,000, 16,000, all those. It's going to keep going. At 25 folds of one piece of paper, it's the thickness of the height of the Empire State Building. At 25 folds. You can look this up. I'm not, I'm not lying to you. This isn't a trick. This is, this is like, believe it or not, 25 times. If you could fold a piece of paper 25 times, which you cannot do, I guarantee you, if you do it, come and show me. It'd be awesome. 25 times, it's the height of the Empire State Building. Guess what happens when you fold it 45 times? Guess how far it goes? To the moon. Yeah. And 46 times is, guess what? To the moon and back, because it doubles every time. Is that not insane? Yeah, that's the power of multiplication. And that's actually how God means his kingdom to extend. It's not that any one of us reaches the whole world for Jesus or changes the whole world for Jesus. You're like, I'm amazing. I'm big and awesome and amazing. No, no, you're a seed. And you plant your life. Jesus says, unless a seed falls in the ground, dies, it will not bear fruit, right? But we plant our lives. We sow our lives. We sow deeds, we sow prayers, and then those things grow. And it, you know, if you lead 1,000 people to Jesus a year for 35 years, you will lead 35,000 people to Jesus, and you would be unbelievably awesome. But if you were not that awesome, if you're just like little old me or you, let's say you lead one person to Jesus a year. You really work at it. You lead one person to Jesus a year. But you show that person how to lead someone else to Jesus. In those same 35 years, instead of reaching 35,000 people, do you know how many people you'll reach? I wish we had time we could do all this math together. Do you know how many people in 35 years, you just double it once a year? It's 7 billion. It's the, it's the population of planet Earth in 35 years. If one person leads one person to Christ a year, and we just double that every year. That's how the king, that's, that is literally how the gospel with his little ragtag group in Jerusalem on Acts chapter 2 exploded into the world, right? And, and like a few years, there's just a few. And then a few more years, there's a few more. And then a few more years, there's like, whoo, that's a lot. You ever seen multiplication, how that happens? Right? And we talked a few months ago in our church about fruit flies. You ever seen fruit flies multiply? It's amazing, right? Okay, okay. so here's, here's the deal. Um, actually, I saw a meme on uh, Facebook recently. It said this. If a tiny virus can do that much damage, imagine how much good my mustard seed of faith can do. Right? Imagine how much good can happen. So in God's kingdom, it's a small, often the small and seemingly inconsequential things that end up having the biggest, most significant impact in our lives and in the world. And that's just the way the kingdom works. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His, his ways are higher. His thoughts are, are, are better. But here's the neat thing about God. You can learn his ways. We can learn his thoughts. Uh, scientists years ago, one, one scientist said this, and actually uh, followers of Jesus who are scientists have used this term a lot ever since. They said, science is thinking God's thoughts after him. Isn't that a neat concept for science? You know, you're studying the world. God's thought these beautiful things up, and then we think God's thoughts after him. You know what? Actually, all Christian discipleship, growing in Christ, is thinking God's thoughts after him. It's, it's saying, Lord, I know my thinking doesn't see it all. I know my thinking is lower than yours. But God, thank you for your word, right, where you teach me your way of thinking. And I start to see things in a different way. And I start to, to see that, that even though something is small and hidden and slow and steady, God is at work and God is multiplying. And God is the God who turns a little guy's lunch <laughs> in the Bible into something that feeds, what, 5,000 plus people. I'll close with this story. There's a guy named Phil Cook who's a, a documentary Christian documentary uh, maker, 
And years ago, he was in Africa filming a large evangelistic outreach. And Phil had the opportunity to interview a gentleman named Nicholas Bengu. Time magazine called Nicholas Bengu the Billy Graham of Africa. Uh, Because as an African man, he had reached more Africans with the gospel than any man in history. He was in his late 70s at the time that Phil interviewed him, and since then, uh, Nicholas has passed away. But Phil got set up for the interview, and he sat down with Nicholas, and he said, hey, I I just want to know what it's been like for you to have had this opportunity to lead so many people to Christ, more people than any other man in history to this point uh, in, in, in Africa. And Nicholas was a a humble guy, and he said, actually, I'd rather tell you a different story. Let me tell you about a missionary couple, a young couple, who left their home to go to Africa because they felt God calling them to share the gospel in Africa. And Nicholas said this. He said, this couple went. They were kind of naive. They weren't very good at missions, and honestly, they preached and preached and preached, and nobody would come to their meetings. Nobody would listen to what they had to say. They, they, they fundraised from back home. They were able to raise enough money to build a, a, a building. And the building sat empty week after week, year after year, month after month, year after year. And, and after they spent most of their adult life in Africa, the only person they actually had built a relationship with was this little guy who they paid to carry their luggage. After that, they didn't have a single convert. Not a single person was led to Christ. So after preaching for all those years and getting no response whatsoever, their denominational headquarters, their church, was kind of embarrassed about this whole scenario, no fruit, and eventually called them back home. Now, this was back in the day when they had to take a ship to get back home. So when they left, the only person that saw them off was the little boy who would help them carry their gear. And the missionary couple arrived home feeling embarrassed and humiliated. They both passed away a few years later, convinced that they had been complete failures. But what they did not know, says Nicholas Bangu, is I was that little kid. And God didn't send them over to reach a thousand people or a hundred people or ten people. He sent them over to reach me. And since then, I've been able to reach more Africans than any other man in history. See, you and I have no idea. When we just take our little lunch, our little gifts, and say, God, take my life. And we feel like, ah, oh, it doesn't seem that meaningful. It doesn't seem that significant. You know, I often think one conversation I have off to the side with one of my kids could be a hundred times more significant than 50 sermons I preach. We don't know. We don't know how God will use each of these things. We simply get to lay them at his feet. And so I want to close today just by praying together and inviting God to speak to each one of our lives. So why don't you stand with me and we'll just take a few minutes with the Holy Spirit. And this is how we close our our messages as a church. We just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Because we want to take God's word and then make it personally applicable. So, I mean, I've been thinking about this this week for my own life. Um, Just thinking about the areas where I can tend to get discouraged, where I can tend to want to see more on the outside earlier. I heard about a Bible college prof this week who sat his class down and he said, I want you to write all your dreams out, how you would want to serve God with your life. All these young Bible college students write out all their dreams. And then he said, you know what I want you to do? I want you to crumple that up and throw it away. <laughs> and these kids were like, oh, how can you do that? And they all threw it in the garbage. And then he said this, he said, you know why? Because your dreams are way too small. Way too small. Our God is way bigger than what you are dreaming. And here's the paradox of it though. What God wants to do in and through your life is way bigger than you could possibly imagine. It really is. And it's also way smaller in its seed form than you probably could ever realize. And I I really felt like one of the things the Holy Spirit might want to say to us today is just where have you been discouraged? Where have you felt like things aren't happening as fast as you would like? Maybe in your own heart and 
transformation journey or maybe in somebody else's life. And I, I just feel the Holy Spirit would say to you, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Would, would you be willing to just sort of lay yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, here's my life. Doesn't feel that big, doesn't feel that significant. But in the hands of a big God, I'm willing to trust you. And I'm willing to lay some of those discouragements, some of those burdens, some of those things that weigh heavy on my heart. I'm willing to, to put those down. I know for me as a pastor, in many ways, the last probably two months have just been a laying down of this church at the feet of Jesus. And just, you know, every day waking up and going, okay, God, it's not my church, it's your church. And I'm not going to trust what I see on the outside. I'm going to trust what you're doing in the hearts of people, in the lives of people. And I'm going to trust you've got dreams and ideas way bigger than I could ever dream. But also different, right? God sees it from a whole different plane. So if that's you today and you just say, you know what, I, I need encouragement. And uh, I, I just hear the Spirit of God calling me to trust Him again to be encouraged again with some of these dreams that maybe I've laid down or some of these areas that I felt I haven't seen the progress that I'd like. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand? We'll just say a prayer. Yeah, right on, right on. Wow, God, Holy Spirit, would you blow a fresh wind of encouragement across this congregation, across the, the homes of people joining online and the campers and wherever people are online. Holy Spirit, come right now and just remind us that your ways are not our ways, that you're at work, that if we could see it all right now, we wouldn't even believe it. And that God, you have great plans. And Father, help us to be those who would simply lay our lives at your feet, not to, not to, to, to say, God, make me spectacular or make me big, but Lord, let me be small. Let me just be a seed, a vessel in your hand one through whom you can get all the glory. You know, one more thing I want to pray. Some of you haven't come to a point where you've really fully entrusted your life to Christ, where you've really said, Jesus, you're my savior and there's nothing else I can lean on. Do you know that Jesus came as a seed? He sure didn't come in the way people expected him to. He didn't come as this mighty savior. He came as a servant. And he came to lay down his life on a cross, really to bury that seed of his life for you. He was planted in the ground. And you know, I always imagine how tough it must have been for those disciples to wait with Jesus in the tomb, hidden there. It seemed like nothing was happening, and yet God was indeed working by his spirit. And that seed eventually came to harvest, right? Jesus rose again. And he just made this declaration that he's offering to all of humanity forgiveness, reconciliation with God, a new life. And you might not understand it all. In fact, none of us grasp it all. But with whatever you grasp today, if you've never really surrendered your life to Christ, I just say, would you do that today? Would you just say, yep, today's my day. I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus. So if that's you, I want to say a prayer for you as well. Would you just lift up your hand and say, yeah, you know what? Today is my day. Those of you online, you can just type in the comments, I'm in. Those of you here in person, just show a hand. Yeah, right on. One here. Anybody else? Just say, yeah, today's my day. So Father, I pray for those who are saying, today is my day. Jesus, I am really and truly surrendering my life to you. You gave your life to me. I give my life to you. You died on the cross for my forgiveness. Lord, forgive me now for resisting that, for holding back. And I just ask that today I would know that forgiveness and that cleansing in my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're gonna hey, everyone. Thanks for joining on the message today. I hope you found it encouraging. 
And if today was your day, if you decided you're going all in for Jesus, if you became a Christian, then today is the best day of your life. So what's next? The next thing you need to do is tell somebody about it. So you can let us know by emailing us at connect at victorymj.com or fill out our connection card on our website, which is victorymj.com forward slash connect. Now, if you would be so bold as to partner with us, you could do that simply by liking and sharing this on social media or wherever you consume this content. The other way you can partner with us is financially. You can donate securely on our church app or on our website or even e-transfer at admin at victorymj.com. And if you do any of those things, we would really appreciate it because it helps us continue to make content just like this to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So thanks again for joining us and I hope to see you all in the next one. God bless.